Hello, my name is Chris Teal. I'm Senior Vice President uh, at Ipsos Market Access. And it's my pleasure to present to you this, this today, uh, a short lecture entitled Pricing and Access Challenges in the Absence of Data uh, in Rare Diseases, Oncology and Gene Therapies. Basically, uh, we're seeing a situation where we're seeing the absence of randomized control trial data and or data, and we're actually seeing data derived from open label single arm studies. Uh, in the area of rare diseases, we're seeing uh, challenges with patient recruitment and the evaluation of treatment effect due to low disease pre prevalence. In oncology, we're increasingly seeing a tumor agnostic licensure, which of course brings its own major challenges to health technology assessment of those assets. In gene therapies, we are seeing uncertainty surrounding long-term outcomes and duration and durability of effect, uh, and also the challenge of high price density with those one high one-off upfront costs. So I think you can summarize um, the whole challenges we face is in terms of they're really focused on managing uncertainty and affordability. On the solution side, we're seeing pharmaceutical companies, manufacturers, looking at creative ways of evidence generation, the use of multi-source data and modeling. They're often looking at conditional reimbursement, conditional access, coverage with evidence development. We're seeing financial and outcomes-based risk sharing. We're seeing managed entry agreements. And increasingly, specifically in the area of gene therapies, we're seeing innovative funding models drawn from other industries, such as the financial services industry, with things like annuities. And I think you can summarize the solutions very simply as being in terms of data engineering and financial engineering. So um, increasingly, we're seeing non-comparative data plus modeling is actually acceptable in circumstances where randomized control trials are not appropriate because randomized control trials are not always ethical, feasible, or practical to undertake. And in uncontrolled studies are acceptable, but there are certain caveats. Certainly uh, the FDA, even as far back as 13 years ago in 2007, um, ex ex outlined that where change in a condition can be clearly attributable to the therapy, placebo response is minimal and prognosis is bleak, and there is no acceptable control arm, they are quite prepared, as is the EMA, to accept uncontrolled studies. But it's not always the case. The background disease itself is very important and relapsing and remitting, remitting diseases would be inappropriate as they are tied to event endpoints. And also, if you are going to use uncontrolled studies, it's very important that the endpoint must also be hard and objective. And indeed, non-comparative studies may provide the best available evidence. And they may be non-comparative in a clinical trial setting, for example, dose ranging, single arm trials, case series, or case reports. And in the case of a real world setting in terms of registry studies, claims data, and some observational designs. Probably the most interesting area is actually the use of modeling, both in the regulatory assessment and health technology assessment, where you actually undertake a comparison of a single arm trial with an artificial comparator arm that has been constructed out of real world data based on modeling. And that's increasingly being used by regulatory, in some regulatory submissions and health technology assessments. So in reality, there may be a lot of useful data available in, even in the absence of a randomized controlled trial. And these new types of data may include you know, the real-time data, the data that's collected through digital health technologies, including apps and wearables, primary care databases, secondary care databases, such as hospital uh, episode statistics, audits of clinical practice, surveillance and monitoring data, uh, databases released by public health and social care authorities, data that represents the views and experiences of people using services, whether it's captured formulary, formally through surveys, or informally, for example, online discussion forums, social media, and patient experience sites. An example in mind thinks of healthtalk.org and data collected by patient organizations. But I have one clear take home message. Demonstrating value using multi-source data does need forethought, 
planning and investment of time and money. It is not and never will be a quick fix when you get to registration. It is a critical factor for a product success. I, I mentioned earlier that the integrated, integration of data from multiple sources is useful and increasingly a requirement, but it often does require careful and intelligent modeling and what I term data engineering. So for example, linking randomized control trial with real world evidence will help answer payers treatment sequencing questions. Curve fitting and data uh, ex expo extrapolation uh, are common, as you see in the diagram on the right hand side of this slide, where you're fitting various statistical uh, curves to uh, real world Kaplan Meyer survival. Uh, and, but some, and, and these are sometimes important uh, in situations where you see crossover, where modeling overall survival cannot be demonstrated using uh, classical biostatistics, such as I'm showing on the right. And there are more sophisticated methodologies that you may wish to consider um, in this situation. There are other things that you might want to amplify um, uh, and highlight. For example, quality adjusting data, such as PFS, can sometimes magnify a small difference between products into one that has significant value differentiation in patient, physician, and payer eyes. So payer questions can be addressed uh, using data engineering and financial engineering. The first thing that comes to mind is treatment sequencing in oncology, for example. The payer value story and messaging should not just be restricted to a particular position or line in therapy. Today's payers want much more than a selective and arguably biased story around a single product. Payers, physicians and patients are interested in the outcome, the clinical outcome and the economic outcome of the management of the disease from diagnosis to death. Clearly affordability is high on the payers agenda. The, for, and in oncology, for example, cost versus value of high priced, high value combinations, combina or cancer stacks. And I suppose in recent times, companies have moved on from a simple concept that a product such as a pill has a price such as X dollars per month. Companies are, or certainly are likely to be in the future offering innovative product propositions that link drug administration, diagnostic and digital app solution packages, innovative pricing propositions such as single lifetime pricing and annuities, and financial uh, uh, engineering through the apportionment, uh, apportionment of value, as was recently reported in an excellent study that was published by the Office of Health Economics a couple of about a month ago, which looked at the, the need for um, uh, new outcome based value attribution framework for combination regimens in oncology, particularly important when. Uh, multiple companies are negotiating pricing and access. The third area that is particularly important for payers is one of predictability. Payers value both clinical and economic predictability, and in some cases, even more highly than they value cost effectiveness. Clinical predictability is driven by patient and treatment selection, increasingly informed by genom genomics and biomarkers. Economic predictability can often be managed by the structure of the pricing proposition and financial engineering. And finally, we look at clinical endpoints and outcomes, which are fundamentally different. Classical oncology clinical outcomes, such as medium overall survival, are less dominant in the cancer immunotherapy and personalized healthcare world. Endpoint metrics that are predictive of outcome, of, of outcome resonate more strongly with payers. Although, don't want to underestimate that, of course, overall survival is still critically important. Increasingly, payers are faced with an array of metrics. So linking payer education to these metrics and with payer value messages is increasingly necessary and critical for success. I, I mentioned earlier in this presentation, the shift uh, towards and the move to the trend towards tumor agnostic licensure. And of course, that is tremendously advantageous from a patient perspective in giving uh, early licensing into their various 
cancers, but of course it can result in limited data for health technology assessment and payer decision making. So the, the, it's, it's worth focusing for a little while on the challenges. You know, tumor agnostic therapies address considerable unmet needs and their genetically targeted mechanisms can be a value driver, but challenges do arise in demonstrating value, this value to payers. And heterogeneous tumor types within uh, patient populations can complicate comparative choice and lead to sample sizes uh, to, to small sample sizes in addressing endpoint in, in assessing endpoints, creating difficulty in HDA assessments based on patient characteristics. And we can see that in a couple of examples of, 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 of molecules that have gone through the EMA and the FDA that are tumor agnostic. So lack of established tumor agnostic therapies makes actually identifying comparative data and determining cl clinical superiority a significant challenge, particularly in countries like Germany and France, where relative clinical benefit is highly valued. Uh, this uncertainty around lack of clinical comparator factored, for example, into the no added benefit decision in Germany uh, for loractanib uh, in TRK fusion positive solid tumors. And for NICE's conclusion in England that uh, Lactolib's cost effectiveness is uncertain due to the distribution of tumor types, including some rare tumors, and the unknown effect of patient characteristics. Ultimately, that led to a conditional recommendation by NICE for that particular product to be uh, funded through the Cancer Drug Fund, while it giving the opportunity for the manufacturer, Bayer, and for a certain manufacturer of a similar product, um, Roche, to um, to generate further data during the time that the, uh, the product is, was funded by the Cancer Drug Fund. What about solutions in this situation? Well, there are a few analogs that come to mind and you can actually learn significant lessons from the process of biosimilar indication extrapolation. When it comes to payer strategies, given the uncertainties in the level of data, you need to emphasize and focus on unmet needs and the budget impact. They're the things that tend to deliver positive access and reimbursement decisions. And the other factor you may wish to consider is actually tumor ring fencing to avoid overall price dilution. This is particularly important for products that have got a tumor ag agnostic licensure, but at the same time are already marketed for given specific tumors. Um, and finally, um, there are ways of mitigating payer uncertainties around tumor agnostic products. This can be done through thoughtful planning of comparator arms, statistically sound utilization of real world evidence in clinical analyses, uh, deliberately and deliberate and pre-specified choice of tumors for inclusion in your health technology assessment submission, and the powering of trials to ensue to ensure an appropriate number of patients are actually included. I'm going to move on now very rapidly to gene therapies. And here the key word is financial engineering. Gene therapies present specific challenges, cost and affordability, funding flows, cash flow, uncertainty, absence of data around long-term benefit, and the whole question of value definition. And quite clearly cost is the biggest concern. The cost of these therapies can be extremely expensive. You know, I, when I wrote this slide, I said 400,000 to a million dollars at the high end. We're now significantly north of a million dollars with some recent gene therapies. Uh, and, and, and budget impact could be amplified depending on the size of the patient population. A further challenge is the timing of these costs. The fact that all or most of the costs are upfront, not borne over time as with chronic therapies. There is also significant uncertainty around long-term benefit. Um, the pathway to approval for gene therapies, especially if expedited, may yield shorter term data on efficacy than what is needed to prove the long-term benefits in the therapy on which the health technology assessment and the assessment of cost effectiveness will be based. This results in considerable uncertainty around how long the therapeutic benefit of the gene therapy will last 
and whether a single administration will be sufficient to provide that elusive cure. This impacts on patients' willing on payers' willingness to pay, and indeed the ability to pay, limited on the limited by the traditional model of short-term budgets. And as I said, the actual definition of, of, of value is particularly challenging. Um, and, and payers may have to incorporate measurements of value to patients, uh, uh, the healthcare system and society uh, in the standard value assessments that are beyond what they normally evaluate. Um, and may, many payers are actually resistant to the idea of price, pricing and reimbursement being um, tied to measurements which are novel compared to the offset of medical cost. So there's often a need to change funding flows to relieve financial pressures. And do gene therapies create significant administrative and financial pressure for providers? And simplest billing and coding systems can be burdensome and complex and can cause significant delay for, for the patient. And, and payers encounter additional financial pressure in the form of markups from hospitals or specialized treatment centers, which can add, can be a percentage of the payment in addition to the cost of the therapy itself. One option is for the payers to purchase the gene therapies directly from the manufacturer and pay the manufacturer directly to avoid these markups. So there are lots of different payment options for the gene therapies, whether they be uh, discounts and budget caps, outcomes-based risk sharing, expedited risk pools, loans, mortgages, annuities, reinsurance, supplier credit, direct payment. All of these have been considered and are being considered with gene therapies. And any one or combination of these financial models have the potential to incentivize payers to invest in a gene therapy that may produce a, a better health outcome and lower cost over time as opposed to paying for a comp competing product that is administered with higher long-term costs or even with a larger one-time uh, upfront cost for a curative therapy. We move on now rapidly to the challenges of rare diseases. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, payers are suspicious. They're unconvinced that rare diseases are that rare. rare. And they have right, uh, reason for that. What happens when new diagnostic techniques indicate a much higher prevalence of this rare disease and new therapeutics lead to an explosion in patients treated. So there's a need for systemic changes to health technology assessment methods are required. And again, a common take home from this, this, this talk is that multi-source data and financial engineering can be used to address these uncertainties. And you know, recently published by an ISPOR working party was a summary here, the, the challenges in research, the low disease prevalence, the problems of disease recognition and diagnosis, the evaluation of treatment effect and the patient view. And probably more critically even are the challenges of health technology assessment. There is no tailored health technology assessment method for rare disease treatment. And obviously the high levels of uncertainty are challenging for health technology assessment authorities. So as we start to look ahead, and I recognize this has been a pretty speedy uh, run through, uh, as we look ahead, the future of healthcare will increasingly see the absence of randomized controlled data, trial tile data for ethical and feasibility reasons. But we will have more and more alternative often unstructured data sources available to use. For rare diseases, oncology and gene therapies, the challenges of uncertainty and affordability will be addressed in the future increasingly by innovative data engineering and innovative financial engineering. So I'd like to thank you for, the, for, for this talk, uh, for listening to my talk. Uh, we will be following up uh, in the next uh, four to six weeks by a much more detailed um, webinar, global webinar, which will address these and other issues in the future of pricing. Um, I invite you to contact me if you have interest on this. Uh, as I say, I'm Chris Teal at, um, at Ipsos.com. There's my, my bio, and I'd be delighted to speak to any of you um, going forward on any of the issues that I've raised in this presentation. I thank you for your time today and uh, very much look forward to uh, 
hearing from some of you in the future. Thank you.